are back. Joining us for our first conversation, we are talking all about uh, the recent events which I'm sure are in everybody's mind, talking about the tragedy which took the lives of four of our soldiers from the Belize Defense Force. And joining us for this conversation is a retired officer from the Belize Defense Force, which is Major Lloyd Jones. Good morning and thank you for joining good us. Morning. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, Belize. Yeah. Now I'm sure that you, uh, especially as a retired officer with the force, um, have been uh, keeping up with this story as all of us have. Um, over the past few days. So um, perhaps we can start by getting your immediate reaction to uh, the events as they played out last week. And what uh, were your initial thoughts when you read, uh, when you heard of the reports? Well, um, my first uh, thoughts were uh, one of astonishment. I could not believe, one, that the, the chopper had gone down, but two, that the BDF did not seem to recognize that the chopper had disappeared. Yeah. And that is what really concerned me. And then after they finally became aware, it seems that they were set out to try and deceive the Belizean people by not giving us the full story. And I think that is lamentable. Yeah. Now, what, what about uh, what you've heard so far makes you feel that uh, the BDF and national security have not been forthcoming? Well, um, at the press conference, um, I would have thought that the commander of the BDF would have given us a clear timeline as to what happened. Mm -hmm. So the chopper left at 0200 hours, it made a radio check at this position at 0300 hours, it saw the plane at 0400 hours, and that was our last communication. Mm -hmm. None of that. Um, and so um, it tells me that they don't know, and then you, you get conflicting stories. And on top of that, the minister and the CEO would not give the general sufficient time to explain to us. They seem to be managing the story, and that I think uh, is cause for concern. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that begs an important question, which I think is in every, which has been in everybody's mind, is that, uh, as you say, we would have expected there to have been a timeline, and I think people are really asking uh, what are the protocols and the procedures that should have been in, or that should be in place when an operation is going out, especially when we're talking about the use of a helicopter. Um, we don't really know the details of the type of mission or the full details that they were on. Yeah. But everybody's asking what uh, should have been followed. How come uh, there seems to have, people seem to have been ignorant of so many different parts yeah. of the story? Mm -hmm. Well. Um, there are standard procedures, standard operating procedures relating to the maintenance of communications. Mm -hmm. So usually when you have an operation, you are given written orders. Mm -hmm. So uh, the commander prepares his orders, well his staff prepares the orders, he reviews it and if he's happy, he signs it and you get a copy and one goes to the file. Mm -hmm. In that orders, and I can't give you the exact content of those orders, but in, that order, in those orders would be a section that speaks about command and signals. And what that does is that it tells you who is in command of the operation, and if that person becomes incapacitated, who takes over from that person. Okay. And it gives you a clear picture of who is in command. And then in terms of the signals, it tells you what uh, codes we're using for that yeah. day. Uh, it tells you uh, when you are supposed to make what we call radio checks and it tells you when you are supposed to make what we call sit reps. So a radio check, for example, would be for the crew to come onto the radio and to say, hello, headquarters, this is the helicopter. They, they will say it like that, there are code words yeah. that you use. Um, hello, headquarters, this is the helicopter, uh, radio check over. And then the headquarters should reply, hello, helicopter, this is headquarters, we read you strength five, strength two, strength one, and that is, this, the, the, if you're at strength five, that means we have very good communications, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's it, that's all you do. So it's like a gauge that you Correct. have along the way, right? okay. Um, and that should be done frequently. That would have been captured in the orders as to when you should make those radio checks. There are some times when we, we have to maintain what is called radio silence. So once you leave a certain point, no more communications until something happens. Yeah. Right? I don't think that this is one of those operations that would require radio silence. Usually you maintain radio silence when the opposing force has the capacity to be able to pick up your signals. In this case, I don't think that that, that would have been the case. So the routine would have applied here. Mm -hmm. um, but even if they, even if they did, um, the, the plane was detected 
uh, at early in the morning, by 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. In fact, the press conference was mid-morning, so. Mm -hmm. So after that, after then that, would there would have been no to, need for exactly, radio silence. Uh, yes, correct. Yeah. You know, so, um, so it is, on, I think not even the BDF knows when exactly the, the, the aircraft went down. And I think that will be one of the, 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 the um, areas that the Commission of Inquiry or whatever inquiries are, are, being, are taking place will have to try and determine when exactly did the chakra go down yeah. uh, and how could we have missed it. Now, we have to be honest and say that there, usually anytime there's a tragedy, there's a bit of um, unwillingness from people to accept the information being presented. And, and we've all become skeptics and to a certain extent conspiracy theorists. But there's been a lot of talk of things that just don't seem to add up. And we're still waiting for those answers from the official sources. Uh, so two issues that have come to the forefront. One was the actual departure time. So people in the area have been saying that they hear, they heard activity from 2 a.m. in the morning. Officially what was said at the press conference was that they departed um, later than that. They're saying uh, 4 a.m. I believe. So there's, there's a discrepancy in terms of time. The second is that the rest of the force, the people who were at the base, did not know what's going on. So I want to address the second one first. How, how likely is it that a command could have been given and other people in the force would not know? In the normal course, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. But because it appears that there is a parallel chain of command, which is a troubling part for me, a parallel chain of command in the BDF that can deploy the BDF without the knowledge of the commander of the BDF. And that parallel chain of command, by, based on what we're hearing, is politically controlled. That is extremely worrisome. Is that allowed for, though? Well, And when the, you say that, you mean it comes from the CEO or the minister? Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, lawfully, no. And if the commander and the officers in the BDF don't have the moral courage to say, I'm very sorry, Mr. Minister, but this can't work, then people go along, you see? Um, and, and I think if we believe the stories, that is what has happened, where the, the ministry is talking directly to the JIC, the Joint Inf uh, Intelligence Coordinating Center, and then the JIC is deploying the BDF. That is not how it works. The JIC it is... should go through the command. Correct. The JIC is uh, basically a clearinghouse for intelligence. They gather all the intelligence, and then when they find something that's actionable, they pass it to the relevant service, or more than one. Mm -hmm. But it goes to the commander, and then he deploys his troops. Because as a commander, you have to know what your troops are doing. And you also yeah. have to know who will be best equipped to be able to execute. Exactly. So we we'll go to uh, Commissioner Williams, mm -hmm. to the head of Coast Guard, to the Correct. head of the BDF. And then they then decide which unit to deploy and so on, because they really are the experts in that respect. So um, if there is, in fact, a parallel chain of command, I think all Belizeans have to be concerned about that. Mm. Because then I'm thinking that, as you're saying that, um, we end up with a situation like this where there's a lot of unanswered questions because there would, I would assume, be a lack of uh, proper record keeping and proper protocol to apply in that situation. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, it muddies the waters and so now the commander of the BDF is scrambling to try to understand what happened when in fact if, it, if the information had flowed properly he would have been in the know, you see, and for the aircraft to deploy uh, that requires the highest authorization. We only have two helicopters. Mm -hmm. They're high value assets and uh, they fly only with the permission of the commander. So for it to be out and not, uh, and the commander not know is, is worrisome. Yeah. The other thing about the timeline, why the timeline is important and the investigators are going to want to look at that is the fuel capacity of the, of the chopper. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a two hour difference, right? So that's a lot of flying time um, and so could it be that they did leave at two, were on operations, did not recognize that they had run low on fuel and, and lost power because of, of the lack of fuel? All of these things, uh, the investigation is going to have to probe to determine yeah. uh, what happened. I mean, the response to the 2 a.m., the, the, the sounds I heard at 2 a.m. that was given was that they were doing preparatory checks before. Um, but the investigation would reveal uh, all that information yes. as well. Um, a, a rotary wing aircraft, um, unlike a fixed wing, you start the engines, you do your check inside, and then you take off. Okay. Uh, helicopters go through a different uh, pre-flight 
uh, sequence, mm -hmm. which does involve indeed a, a, a slight hovering to ensure that the aircraft is, is okay yeah. before you leave. But that wouldn't take two hours. What we haven't heard a lot about is whether or not the flying conditions were right. And, um, you know, I know it's a very technical conversation, but we know that that was, in fact, the night that the cold front came in, um, there were gusty winds and all these other things. Uh, so we had the, the drizzle. Um, mm. I don't know what it was in that exact area. There was no reference to it in the press conference, which mm. I found strange. Mm. So I'm assuming that the weather was fine to fly in. Yeah. Well, usually the, the decision to fly on paper mm -hmm. rests with the, the pilots. Okay. Um, and even at sea, um, you, the owner of a vessel can't instruct the captain to go to sea. That is entirely up to the captain. Okay. So that morning, for example, I understand that the cruise ships decided it was too rough, the weather was not good, and they were not going to come to port. The owners of that cruise ship can't call the captain and say, no man, we are lose money, go to it. They can't do that. So the onus is entirely on the pilot. So the pilot gives clearance. Yes, but uh, we can't discount the, the pressures of command. Mm -hmm. uh, I served in the BDF for 15 years, and I can tell you, commanders, in fact, on your evaluation, there is a part that says ability to get things done. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you call me and say, Major, I want you to go on, on this flight, and there's a drug plane, and I say, Commander, the weather is bad, I can't fly. He will shout at you and tell you, you you're covered and uh, there's a lot of pressure that comes on you. When it's time for your evaluation, that section that says ability to get things done, what do you think your grade will be? So the pressure is there, even though in your own mind you feel like, boy, it's this kind of iffy, the pressure of command forces you to act. Now everybody will say, no, but that's your decision. But they will not tell you about the pressure that is put on you to, to act the way they want you to act. Well, let's, 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 let's talk about what I think is the, the most concerning part of this um, incident, which is the lack of communication throughout the entire day. Um, what was communicated at the press conference was that this was typical, and in fact, until night, until it became nighttime, that's when they realized something was wrong for a mission that started pre-dawn. Well, I, I, I don't know who told the, the minister that, but that is absolute nonsense. Um, aircraft in particular, because of in the, you, you have to understand that aircrafts are unforgiving. You make a mistake and you will pay the ultimate price. Um, and so because of that, we keep ensuring that there's constant communication, constant communication. Where is the aircraft? What are you seeing? That kind of thing. You don't send an aircraft out at four and don't bother to check on it until 4 in the evening, 4 in the morning till 4 in the evening, maybe 5. And in fact, by, based on what we're hearing is that it was not until the following the evening, until the following morning, that they recognized that the, the helicopter had not returned. And the minister said that the, the helicopter would, would normally hover in the area or would land. Um, well, the helicopter, once it lands, then obviously there's no communication, but the helicopter would tell headquarters that it is, it is landing and what position it is landing. Mm -hmm. So it, they don't just go and land somewhere and say, oh, well, they, maybe they land. No. They would say, look, headquarters, we are now going to land at this position, right? And when they land, they say, okay, we'll land safely, and then they cut off communications. When they're about to leave again, they would inform headquarters that we're leaving. That's, those are standard and basic uh, rules of, of the game. So Would there be any reason in your mind why there would have been no communication throughout the entire day? The only reason would be if the, the communications equipment fails. So if, if the radio on board for some reason failed, then they would not have been able to communicate. But at that point, the pilots would have to make a decision to say, look, we have lost comms and the proper thing to do is to return to base. Mm -hmm. You see, so they would not be flying around without, without communications. It's, it's, those are basic rules. You lose communications, you lose certain equipment on board, uh, you return to base. But, and then isn't, well, is there also a protocol if, you know, from the base's perspective, if they lose communication with the helicopter, isn't, shouldn't they also um, start to mobilize or do, make some sort of report so as to try and locate the yes. people, especially on the type of mission yes. that they were on? Yes. For example, with the, with the foot soldiers, the infantry, mm -hmm. Uh, they go on patrols in the Chiquibol or in Rio Blanco, it was very tense, uh, dense jungle. Sometimes you cannot uh, make communications, right? And so if you miss a radio check, if you miss a 
a sit rep uh, time. Uh, they say, okay, did he call? No. Okay, we'll give him the, uh, the, the next radio call. He doesn't call. And if after 24 hours they don't hear from you, they deploy another patrol to find you. Mm -hmm. But that is for the infantry. You are on the ground, and we assume that you've just simply lost communications, right? We come and we look for you. You can't do that with an aircraft. So if there's a problem with the aircraft, it will come down. So if you don't hear from the aircraft, likely uh, there's, there's a chance that something has gone wrong, and it is your duty to get out there as quick as possible to see what it is. So um, given the location of that, um, of the area of the operation, which is a short flight from Price Barracks, um, they should have deployed another aircraft to go and look right away to see where is this aircraft and why is it not in communication. Because if I understand you right, what you're saying is the dangers that are linked to just flying is what would have made it a more urgent matter right. to, to right. follow up if there was no That's communication. Right. And it would be um, interesting to find out how, how uh, our brothers died. Uh, because if it was by drowning, then I think a lot of people are going to be in trouble because it would mean that perhaps they survived the initial crash but were in the water without assistance. Uh, leading to their to their drowning, uh, and I think that also has to be a, a, a point of focus for the inquiry. Mm -hmm. Now, what has also come to light, which I think is is perhaps part of the heart is is a heartbreaking part of the story, is the allegations by the family that they were not informed adequately. Um, so two areas here, two missed opportunities. Um, one is definitely telling them something from the from the press conference. We were told. They noticed the aircraft and the four soldiers were missing the night before. Mm -hmm. But the family was not in informed until they were confirmed dead. Um, is there, there has to be a protocol in place in terms of mm -hmm. if a soldier is missing, even if they're in the Chikibo, that you inform the family. Yes. Is there one? Yes. 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 And what would Th be that, the standard that, that, protocol? That would be um, the decision of the commander. Uh, he decides at what point to inform the family. Yeah. Um, but then if the commander is unaware that the aircraft is missing, you could understand why he would not say anything. Um, but ordinarily, the adjutant, who is kind of like the, the administrative officer for the, for the force, would be the one to then, on the, on the instructions of the commander, to reach out to the family and say, look, uh, we can't tell you exactly what has happened, but the, the, the aircraft left. They have not returned, and we are searching for them. That would have been the very basic. We don't want to create alarm or nothing, yeah. but we just want you in the loop. And it's best to do that, do it that way, rather than for it to come by way of Facebook and, and, and other people and so, so on. So that decision would lie directly in the hands of the commander as to yes. when they would be informed yes. and by whom as well. Yes, yes. So um, since they are air wing, the two officers I know um, live right in Ladyville, so. And given the, the rank of the officers as well, mm -hmm. that message would have been delivered by the adjutant himself, who is, a, I think, a major as well. Mm -hmm. You see? So um, they lost an opportunity to help the family deal with this. They've created a lot of anger and mistrust. Um, and I think that is really regrettable. Yeah. Now, in the face of all these uncertainties, uh, it's built a lot of... of, of uh, concerns from people as to what really happened. Some things just don't seem to add up. We're using our own logic and not mm -hmm. necessarily our understanding of how things work in the force. What's, what's your thoughts and feelings in, in looking at all that has happened? Um, I think that the, the aircraft encountered a catastrophic mechanical failure, whether that was the engines or whether it was the rotary system or the hydraulic system, there was something catastrophic that happened that did not even give the pilots an opportunity to make a call. And, and, and so two things happen uh, can lead to that. One, the aircraft is shut down. Or two, there is a cat catastrophic mechanical failure. Because remember now, a helicopter has this, this blade going around. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong, um, that helicopter will spin on that axis. And the G-forces alone will make it almost impossible for you to be able to reach out and turn a radio. Because the internal communications, in, as they are flying, there's an internal communications. To go to base, they have to switch on a radio to go to base. Okay, So to be able to do that, 
if you're under heavy G-forces, you're not going to be able to, to do that at all. Mm -hmm. So something happened that they were not even able to call to base to say, look, I'm having difficulties, uh, I need assistance yeah. or so on. So that was something absolutely catastrophic happened. So it had to be, you, you say catastrophic, but what you mean is sudden, like so, that there was no reaction time or that it was so severe yeah. that the impact on the, on, the, on the vessel yeah. itself. Yeah, it was, it was so severe that uh, the pilots lost control and were not able to recover. And they would have been busy trying to maintain control of the aircraft because you, 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 know, you, you can't talk, you try to figure yeah. what is happening and trying to, to maintain control of the aircraft. Yeah. And I think that is the more likely scenario. So that would then lead to uh, the examination of the maintenance records mm -hmm. to determine if the aircraft was in fact properly maintained. If not, what would have been the likely point of failure? Yeah. Um, and and to, to I, I see on Facebook that people are talking that the, the maintenance records have been seized and people are trying to corrupt. That, that, that's not true. I mean, I, I hate to think that that is the case. Yeah. But the proper thing to do is as soon as the aircraft, uh, an aircraft crashes, the maintenance records are preserved. And that, that, I imagine, would go directly to the commander to make sure, here it is, nobody touches it, nobody interferes with it. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to take charge of it. Um, and so I'm not particularly concerned about that at all. Because there is a pro protocol in yes, place yes. for that. Because in th those are the first things the investigators will do. They will look, where are the maintenance records? Where are the records of the pilots? What kind of training have they done? What kind of uh, experience do they have on this aircraft? That kind of thing. So that is where you start, and then you end up at the, the actual um, remains of the aircraft, and then you visit the, the, the crash site. But do you also foresee any challenges in this particular investigation just because of how this did seem to occur? Because I think what a lot of people can't get past is that it would seem almost uh, illogical to um, accept you know, fully what has been said so far in the sense that this uh, sort of operation um, went on without the knowledge of the commander. Even if, it, even if other people were knowledgeable, it was not being monitored. And then after the fact, Nobody knew what happened until so much so much later. So how can so an investigation in those circumstances must be uh, compromised at some level? Would it, well, or would you think so? Um, not, I, I think it depends on who the, the investigators are. Mm -hmm. uh, for the internal investigators, we have uh, we said it by um, Captain Bennett. Uh, he's an outstanding officer. Um, yeah. Both he and um, Admiral Boland served with me in the BDF Maritime Wing, so I'm familiar with them. Uh, I have no, no problem with him, uh, his prof professionalism, and his ability to, to look at this thing uh, balanced and, and, and fair. I think the problem really is the, the political influence. That is what bothers me. Uh, because if they, were able, if they started off with a press conference trying to, to smooth things out and not be honest and open with us, uh, how are we to believe that if they find something really damaging to the image to the optics that they are not going to try and keep yeah. it on, on, on the down low. Um, but uh, I, I believe that Captain Bennett is going to do a good job. Um, his team uh, seems uh, okay with me, um, but, I, but I do not understand the inclusion of Batsub and, and the, Briti uh, the mili U.S. military liaison officer and uh, those kinds of things. Um, but this is a, a matter Perhaps purely to reinforce, and mm -hmm. especially given the skepticism mm -hmm. that people feel right now. Well, could be, but I, I don't know, perhaps I'm just too much of a, my own man. I, I believe that we ought to learn to take care of things ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what's been lost in this conversation, and it's, it's, it really is sad, is looking at the major loss we have suffered in this country. Um, I think Minister Aragon mentioned it just a bit, but we're not just talking about recent recruits, recent graduates. This is kind of the core of the um, skilled and experienced uh, airmen in our force. Mm -hmm. From your assessment, I mean, how, how, would you, how would you describe the level of loss that we've experienced, not just as the force, but yeah. as the country? Yeah. I think it is significant. Um, Major Ramirez and Major Baez, I know them both very well, um, are exceptional soldiers. and. Um, it is certainly, a, I mean, I can tell you now within the media, if there's, there's like it seemed to have sucked all their energy and all their morale. People are just walking around the camp, dragging themselves, trying to comprehend how could this have happened. Um, and of course, you can't even imagine the impact on their families. Of course. Um, I mean, that is 
by itself a terrible thing, but under these circumstances and with all these uh, strange clouds hanging over. Um, one of the things that strikes me about this is that we had both the commander of the air wing and his deputy flying the same mission. Mm -hmm. And again, this says to me that it could not have come from the commander because we, we learn these things instinctively. You and we put don't put strongest. people together like that. So it would be the, the, the CEO of the air wing and a junior pilot or his second in the command and another junior pilot. That's how you do it. Uh, in fact, there are companies right now in Belize um, that do not allow their two senior people to travel together. Mm -hmm. You go in different vehicles for the same reason that, God forbid, there's an accident, you lose. So what has happened here is that the entire air wing has been decapitated. You see? Um, so it is really a tragic loss, is that, as you Is said. that just a, a practice is it a, a, or actual procedure? Um, when I was there, it was procedure. So uh, when I would I deploy, when I was, would deploy with my troops, I would be in one vehicle, and my we call it the two IC, the second in command would be at the rear in another vehicle. We mm -hmm. never travelled uh, together, so um, I don't understand how this could have happened. And again, this tells me that it couldn't. This order could not have come from the commander. Um, because it goes against yeah, it the goes practice against, of, yeah, exactly. the, of the force. Um, and, and, and so what happens here, again, so I, I, I'm inclined to believe the story that it was not the commander who deployed for that reason and also because after we've conducted operations, as officers we are trained, we are always the last one to go home. We make sure everything is done properly before we leave and that includes we, are, we do a head count. We check everybody, we check all the weapons, we check ammunition, everything and uh, until I am satisfied then I go home. This is not a typical behavior of officers so I am inclined to believe that they came through the jig, they were elated about the bus and then well, uh, well, nobody the troops there, they were on their own and commanders don't do because that. Because there was no, no order yes. with yes. all the details yeah. as to how the mission would go. Yeah. And, I mean we, we can't say this with certainty of course we're yeah. just speculating, I want to be clear but um, I think your insight in, in how things would typically function helps mm -hmm. us to, to put into perspective yeah. some of the questions that need to be asked mm -hmm. and the answers we need to get. Yeah. Um, looking at the, at the experience of these men, is that what inclines you to believe that it's more mechanical failure than anything else? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's a routine flight for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. It's a routine flight. There is nothing extraordinary about it save for uh, the weather might have been a little bit more challenging. But these aircrafts are, are, are tough aircrafts. They have an um, extensive history in, in Vietnam, the airframe, mm -hmm. not necessarily these, although these are some old airframes that were refurbished before they were given to us. Yeah. They're um, about four years old. Mm -hmm. They, they yes. were given in 2016. Yeah. 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 Right. But um, they're, they're more than capable um, to fly in the kind of weather that we had that okay. night. So I don't think so much that the weather was a factor, a factor although bad weather uh, does put extra stress yeah. on the airframe. Um, what about that space, that area? Are there any, any dangers or any um, possible challenges that may be encountered? Not as far as I'm concerned. I, I spoke with a former commanding officer of the air wing and he himself can't understand what happened. There was, there's no reason why this aircraft should have gone down. And like I said, there can be, there are only two, way, two uh, causes, likely causes, Either it was shot down or either there was a catastrophic mechanical failure. And we are leaning towards the catastrophic mechanical failure simply because uh, these, these pilots would know better than to go into what we call a hot LZ, landing zone, mm -hmm. uh, without the cover of the infantry. So for example, what would happen if the, before the helicopter lands, the infantry will go in and clear the area. Okay. And only then and would the sure helicopter no direct correct, threat. Exactly. Only then would the helicopter come down. These guys are too senior and too experienced to so just fly in there like they're a Rambo and try to land a okay. drug plate. And even so, uh, the range of a rifle with the police, I believe, found two M16 rifles. Yeah. The range of our effective range is 200 meters. Yeah. So these guys would be at a ceiling of a thousand meters. So there's no way you can actually shoot that aircraft. And they would hover at about a thousand meters and. And, and observe even yeah. a thousand feet. You still, you understand, you're still not yeah. able to engage with with those short range weapons. Yeah. So that's one of the, the questions the, I've asked. And most mm. people who understand guns say it would take a really massive weapon to yes. be able to shoot yeah. it down. Actually, it, it, and it, it, you would, it, it would look a lot bigger than a little yes. bullet hole, yes. as people have been speculating. Yeah. yeah. So all of this information that you do have, the height that they would travel, the type of weapon. 
um, that would be required leads you to be more inclined to believe <laughs> that failure. we were looking at a yeah. mechanical failure. Because uh, if, if for, for us to dispel this, this, this notion about the aircraft being shot down, even if you came under fire, you recognize you're under fire, the first thing the pilots are trained to do is one, to, to move out the way, but to immediately say to base, hello headquarters, this is the helicopter, contact, contact, contact. Yeah. And that tells us why they're engaging the helicopter and then everybody goes on high state of alert. There were no such calls to the headquarters to say that they had come under attack. Right? Um, so I, 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 I don't uh, believe that that story is a plausible one at all. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of, you know, even looking at the mechanical failure, um, I'm thinking that before an aircraft goes on a, um, you know, any sort of mission, um, aren't, wouldn't there also be a record of, um, you know, what sort of checks were done to ensure that the, you know, that the aircraft was safe to fly and do, in those circumstances? Yes, yes. So before they leave, that's why they do the, they do the pre-flight check. Mm -hmm. And they would they would enter all the details into the records. They will do their um, they will um, they check the communications. They will call base to do a radio check, make sure the radios are working. All that would be done before they, they leave um, on the mission. So there would be records of those at the air wing, um, and by now I believe those records are are at the headquarters for safekeeping. And you've said that typically, if there is any issue that happens with an with an aircraft that the first thing that would happen is that the maintenance re records are handed over yes. to the commander. Yes. That is standard yeah, protocol. Standard. Yes. The commander would send for them and then they would be at headquarters and then that, because those are the first things investigators do. Yeah. The documentary review uh, that gives them an idea as to where they should look uh, uh, you know, and things of that sort. And there should also be a log yes. as well. Yeah. Especially for aircrafts. It's a very meticulous process with aircraft unlike vehicles and even boats, if you go to the water taxis, you find they don't have any maintenance records. Mm -hmm. But you go to Maya and Tropic Air, they have detailed records of everything that they do with those aircraft for precisely the same reason. In the, in the event that there is an accident, the air accident investigator will want to see those records. And if I'm not mistaken, I think by law, uh, those aircrafts have to maintain certain records. Mm -hmm. And even the time that they depart and all the other details, yeah. those yeah. would also be... Yeah recorded. Yeah. Even for example when a, when you see a BDF vehicle in Belize City, if you go to Price Barracks there's a record as to when it left, who was in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Even for a vehicle, that's how it's done. So for the aircraft which is a far more valuable asset, a far more complicated um, uh, opera a platform, there are going to be records. Yes. What are some of the other details that you, given your experience, would be paying attention to as the investigation um, is conducted that we can perhaps be paying attention to as well? Well, um, we don't like to hear it, but um, investigators always look to the human element. Um, I am a trained accident um, and casualty investigator on the maritime side, and our experience shows us about 85 to 90 percent of all casualties accidents are caused by human error. And we don't like to hear it because it's our family and our loved ones. And we hate to think that Especially in their they, death. Yeah, they did something that led to their death. Um, but we, we have to look at the, the crew, the pilots. Uh, we look at issues of fatigue. What were their rest hours? How long were they flying? We look at whether or not they were on medication, whether or not they drink, they are drinkers, whether or not they use drugs. Um, then we look, so we look at the human element. Then we look at the, the airframe itself. And then we look at other surrounding factors, such as where it were, were shut down and things of that nature. So um, those are some of the areas I think that the investigators are going to be probing yeah. to see if we are able to picture, put this picture together as to what exactly happened. Yeah. Now, we don't have a, a full fleet of helicopters. These are you know, prized mm -hmm. items for us. Do we have the expertise to be able to upkeep the proper uh, maintenance? Um, I think so, based on what I have heard, um, these guys were sent abroad to do the proper trading okay. and so on. Uh, and we, we, we did that a lot with the, with the other engineers at the Air Wing. Mm -hmm. We do it uh, for the Maritime Wing and the Coast Guard as well. We send the engineers abroad with the U.S., usually with the U.S. military, to do all the requisite training and so on. 
Okay. Um, and uh, that's one good thing about, well, certainly when I was at the BDF, that's one good thing about the BDF is that they're always training their people, always training their people. Okay. Uh, so I am confident that we do have the expertise to, to properly maintain them. Mm -hmm. The challenge, of course, will be whether or not we had the resources, because that's always a problem for us in the BDF. Um, never resources enough. Resources beyond the skill set. Okay, correct. Uh, never enough. Uh, you can't find. You can't get spare parts. Um, you know, they don't provide you with fuel. They don't provide. So it's, it's, that is, I think, yeah. is the greatest challenge for the BDF. Not necessarily the skills. You know, we haven't talked about fuel capacity either mm -hmm. for for such an extended mission. You're mm -hmm. talking 12, 13 hours mm -hmm. if they did depart at 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. and and until nighttime. Well, the range of that aircraft is about 200 miles. So it is able to fly to PG and back. Okay. Right, and then depending on the speed, uh, you would be able to do the calculations to determine. But the, in any event, after two, three hours of flying, if they're not back to refuel, that should tell you that something is wrong. Hmm. Unless, of course, it had landed. No, if it had landed, then it's different. But yeah. uh, two, three hours of flying, uh, it's, it's a, it's a long yeah, time. I think, and I think that that will be the question that a lot of people will want answers to, just how no one has missed. Um, for soldiers, a helicopter um, for the duration of an entire day. Yeah. Yeah. You have any thoughts on that? No, other than, than gross negligence. <laughs> I mean, we have to call a speed a speed. There's, there's no way uh, that aircraft should have been gone for so long and nobody raised the alarm. Okay. Absolutely no way. All right. You seem down, and I know that this seems to hit you very close to home. Yeah. Yeah, it was a shock when I heard it. I was like, what? I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, this is the first time we have lost, as far as I know, we have lost an officer in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. Not one, but two, two great, two, two good officers. And they're majors as well. Right? So two, two uh, I'm talking about commissioned officers. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, we've lost soldiers before. Uh, yeah. Tragically, we've lost soldiers. Um, we've lost some on patrols with the British. Uh, we've lost some in accidents in, in, in Mountain Pine Ridge and so on. Yeah. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing. We're always shocked when, when we lose our, our troops. Uh, but this is the first time we've had commissioned officers lost uh, in the line of duty. Um, and not one, like I said, but two. So right now, everybody is just trying to wrap their heads around this one. So. Well, we appreciate you coming in and being able to share uh, some insight as to what you know to be the protocols at the Belize Defense Force. Um, we are told that we should be getting initial information within 14 days, 14 days, two mm. weeks, um, to know exactly what happened. Yeah. Well, I, my, my only um, thing would be to, to say to the ministry that they owe us a duty to do a thorough investigation. And I can't understand how it is that we are going to do a thorough investigation in 14 days. Mm. That seems quite a very short time uh, to me to be able to, to, to yeah. flesh this, uh, all of this out. Uh, the aircraft itself has to be reconstructed mm. um, and that alone will take a, a great deal of time to do that. So um, we want answers, yes, but I don't think the Belizean people are looking uh, for just for a rush to, investigation. For a rush investigation to say that we we'll look at it and this is yeah these are the outcomes. I think we, d we deserve a thorough investigation so that this does not repeat itself. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, uh, we'll be talking about Reef Week. So please stay tuned.